There we are on the launch pad. I think this is a picture on the 4th of July or one of our three launch attempts, but I think we'll actually launch this time. Um, uh, vehicles all fueled up and uh, ready to go. We start getting ready about uh, three, three and a half hours prior to launch. About two and a half hours prior, we're walking out. We're carrying American flags for the 4th of July, except for Thomas Ryder in the back, who's German. He's carrying a German flag. Um, I don't know if it's a German 4th of July or not. So we walk into this uh, the uh, vehicle. We head out to the pad. Uh, this is the launch control center, and those folks are getting ready to launch us. They're uh, controlling the vehicle. And uh, we finally get the go. Light up the main engines. Uh, they'll run for about six seconds. We'll make sure they're uh, working okay. And then uh, we're off for quite a ride here in just a few seconds. Here's a shot from the vehicle with all the cameras we had on board. And that's your view if you're on a solid rocket booster. Fortunately, none of us were there. Um, and it was a beautiful day, beautiful day on the 4th of July. To, uh, we roll and uh, we're going to head out over the Atlantic Ocean as we accelerate. And there's a view up in the upper right of uh, Mark, uh, Lisa, and Mike on the flight deck bouncing around a little bit. Uh, pretty good acceleration. You're really getting kicked back in your seats. And you can see the uh, coastline of Florida slowly going away as we, uh, as we climb up. Um, and it was, it was one of those no-wind days where the plume just kind of stayed in place. And so we're going to ride these solid rocket boosters. Those are the white things on the side for about two minutes, and it'll take us up to about 4,000 miles an hour, about 150,000 feet. You can see the shadow in the top of the picture, which is the plume. And there's kind of a close-in view as we're accelerating up and getting further and further away and lower and lower on the horizon for those of you that were watching the launch. Um, about two minutes, the solid rocket boosters are out of propellant, and they're going to pop off here in a minute. Um, you can see they're bouncing around still, but it'll start to smooth out as, the, uh, as we run out of propellant and then continue our way up. And you can see them, the tail off, and there they go. And there's a good shot as the shuttle goes away. Spectacular shot from the solid rocket booster camera. We see a little handshake there. That's at 50 miles, and that's what we, we call you an astronaut when you reach 50 miles high. Uh, eight and a half minutes later, we reached 17,500 miles an hour, and uh, we were in orbit. So that was a very busy flight day one, but there was no time to rest. Flight day two, we started our inspections. We had a lot of those to do. We had the uh, new 50-foot boom on there. Here's a computer simulation of what that looked like uh, from the outside. And you can see we're looking all over the uh, leading edges and underside and all the places that we might have damage. So here's some of the view of the real imagery that we got and send that down. We also did some looking with the end effector camera. You can see there's some of the uh, jets. And you also see uh, all, some tiles. And all this went down. Here's a look at the upper part of the crew cabin. All this went down. The imagery team did a great job analyzing it and sending us data and let us know that our vehicle looked really clean. So the space shuttle after launch is going 17,500 miles an hour. And so is the space station. Problem is, they're really not anywhere near each other. So over uh, three days, we start to catch up. And eventually, we get underneath the space station about 600 miles, directly underneath it. And at that point, we have to do this pitch maneuver. The reason we do this is so the space station crew could take some pictures of the bottom side of Discovery. So this is now us upside down, can't see anything. And we're kind of doing this in the blind, but uh, we have some pretty good expectations of what's going to happen. Uh, eventually, we flip all the way over. And um, now our nose is about pointed towards the ground. Uh, if you, pr you probably guess this is sped up a little, and it is, I think, by about 10 times. Um, when we saw the space station coming over the tail, we were all pretty happy about that, because you like to see it show up where you expect. It would be bad if it was uh, in a different place. and. This is Pavel and Jeff talking about what they saw um, right before we docked. Um, we eventually get in front of the space station, and we uh, slowly approach it. And initially, it's flown by the computers. But later, as we get closer, uh, Steve will manually fly the docking by looking out the window and looking through some cameras. And that's a space station on top and the space shuttle on the bottom. And they come together at about a tenth of a foot per second. So uh, pretty slow. That's, that's sped up there a little bit, too. Not, not all that much. And then we'll uh, bring those two surfaces together. 
and pressurize the vacuum that's between the two vehicles. And um, no, these guys were happy we didn't hit too hard. <laughs> They're also looking forward to uh, seeing some new faces. I think they were getting sick of each other by then. <laughs> so this is us coming in uh, into the uh, U.S. laboratory for the first time. Uh, Jeff is there on the right and Pavel is on the left and uh, we all kind of funnel in. One of the first things we did was take a good look at this new place, starting off on the flight deck of the orbiter, going heads down the ladder, because we can. <laughs> kind of spin around, quick shot through the mid deck, and then going out into the external airlock, kind of flip around, and then uh, go up through the go up through the docking mechanism, through the pressurized mating adapter, and we're looking at the station typically upside down, so you have to do another roll. Uh, it got busy right away with a lot of people doing different kinds of work in there. We're not going to take all of the possible turns. Heading into the node here, Thomas didn't take long to find the computer. Going through another pressurized mating adapter, you see how the crew had everything pre-packed and ready for us. It was just awesome. They did, it. They did a lot. Heading here into the uh, FGB, it's all food stacked against the floor there, or is it the ceiling? <laughs> or No, it's the floor. Heading down through the FGB uh, toward the, toward the uh, aft end, kind of looking across here, we can begin to see into the service module. Oh yeah, I have to do one more roll. And now we're in the service module with uh, Pavel working down at this end. And then we begin our flight day four. Uh, this was our MPLM uh, unberth and install. This is Lisa and I, the robotics workstation uh, on the space station in the laboratory. And we're maneuvering the station arm in to grapple the multi-purpose logistics module that's in the shuttle payload bay. Houses all of our cargo. Uh, this is a shot inside again of Lisa and I with the station crew, uh, Jeff and Pavel, at the robotics workstation. We're maneuvering the uh, logistics module up out of the shuttle payload bay to install it on the uh, node nader port on the station. We install it and then ungrapple and maneuver the shuttle arm, the station arm away. I'm sorry for uh, for that operation. Next, we st on day five we started the EVAs. That's me on the right, exercising, wearing an oxygen mask uh, clamped to my head. That's to get the uh, start getting nitrogen out. Once we go through that pre-breathe exercise protocol, we uh, start getting suited up. You see us in our uh, liquid cooling garments here, and then we get stuffed into the suits and get set. Uh, Piers is free in the middle of the airlock as they uh, start to uh, stuff him into the crew lock. Uh, he's in there now. They've added some bags and uh, trying to wedge me in. Once we get in, depressurize that outer portion, it pop open the, uh, the internal hatch and the outer thermal cover you see flap in there and it's time for Piers to slide outside. We're on the lower left of this. We've started working on the station, picked up a number of uh, uh, picked up a bunch of equipment and working our way into the payload bay of the shuttle where we, you see us here. That's Piers' feet uh, in the, near the center of the screen carrying a large uh, foot restraint and a tool stanchion we affectionately called the uh, hat rack. Uh, pretty big piece of equipment to be hauling around. We set that up on the boom which was on the arm. This is a computer simulation here that shows the two of us on it. Uh, all told that's 100, uh, 100 foot of arm and boom. Uh, Piers went out solo first for some tests, and then the two of us went out to do. Uh, first, we were uh, we affectionately called it bouncing on the boom. Uh, here's a view from Piers's helmet, kind of looking back at the orbiter, it gives you an idea of what kind of a spectacular view you have. It got a little distracting at times. So we did did some work in free space on the boom to see how uh, to do some tests, and then they pushed us in close to structure. And this simulation shows me actually in contact with the end of the truss and I'm simulating different types of uh, activities as if it was a repair to see if the boom and the arm could hold us stable enough to do a repair. Once we completed that, it's a long, slow, dark ride back toward the payload bay. And it does get cold out there, especially when it's night and you cannot see anything made by man. <laughs> Get down close to the payload bay, and there, there we started to uh, pull all of the gear off and uh, get cleaned up to uh, head back toward the airlock. We put all the toys away. Piers is inside and pulls the thermal cover shut. Gee, that went fast. That was seven and a half hours later. That's the end of EVA one.
Occasionally, we had the chance to look out the window. You see the Nile River snaking across toward the left, the Mediterranean Sea, the Nile Delta, and the Red Sea at the top. And this is uh, the beginning of our flight day six. Uh, this was a big transfer day for us. Uh, here I was uh, inside the multipurpose logistics module, and uh, I'm there where, with Steve. Uh, basically, we unload uh, the old items, or the new items for return, and uh, load on the old items. And we worked very, very hard, many, many hours. <laughs> uh, at least that's what the ground thought, but uh, we were really inside the logistics module uh, doing cute astronaut tricks. But uh, here's a shot of a zero gravity stowage rack being transferred. It's a soft uh, rack and it houses the supplies inside. Uh, it takes a couple of people to transfer through the, uh, through the hatchway. And that's a crew transfer bag. Uh, we bring uh, supplies from the shuttle also to the airlock and uh, into the lab. And uh, this is the beginning of EVA2. This is Lisa and I at the robotics workstation uh, beginning the preparations for the robotics apps to support that EVA. Yep, another day, another EVA. First thing we had to do was to pick up this big pump module. It's about 1,400 pounds. And Mike and I lift it up in the back of the shuttle. And uh, ladies get the end effector and grab it out of our hands and swing it over to the space station where they park it on a special storage shelf outside the airlock for use as a spare later on. And then after that, we got to wrestle with the dreaded TUS. But before that happened, we had this spectacular sunrise See how the whole world goes pink, and then copper, and then white in just a few seconds when you're outside. It's really quite the most beautiful thing. See the colors changing. OK, back to the TUS. Oh, here's me trying to find the TUS. Uh, <laughs> life is very close up and personal when you're translating around on the outside of a spacecraft. You tend to concentrate on where you're putting your hands. It's quite easy, though, when you get the hang of it. Mike is on the arm here, and he's grabbing the uh, old TUS, which is about the size of a baby grand piano. And we take it down to the shuttle payload bay, where he hands it off to me. I'm just standing around holding this thing. Then he grabs the new one and swings back to the space station to install it. I won't tell you all the adventures we had with this, but all the bolts stuck, and we had various problems with tools and things. It was very exciting. Here's me trying to hammer the old TUS back into place in the shuttle while uh, Mike is using violence and bad language to try and get the other tuss <laughs> into the uh, truss. There he is, he's swinging it in place. Eventually it all worked out, and we got it in there. Uh, some, some tight moments. This is a close-up of a uh, pistol grip tool, which is just electric bolt driver. It's pretty cool. You can set the, uh, the amount you want to tighten up the bolt, the torque regulator, and then just crank up your bolts with this. And it works most of the time. There you are, spinning up a bolt. If you didn't have one of these, your hands would get very, very tired, even if you're as tough as Mike. <laughs> and here's a nice view, a little scenic view that you occasionally manage to get out of the corner of your eye. Um, between EVAs, Mike and I have got to go and gas up our suits. You've got to change all the batteries, fill them with oxygen, um, resupply the water, change all the, uh, all the little batteries that are associated with the power. Uh, here's a nice picture of some Russian equipment, followed by cloudscapes over the South Pacific. And then it's time for science. <laughs> uh, these guys are playing water polo, a, vari <laughs> a variant. And this is cool. This is a bubble of water with a bubble of air in the middle, which makes a pretty good lens, which basically makes you look normal, Mike, <laughs> compared to other people. The uh, cool thing is you can drink the water out of the air. Uh, Lisa has a very dignified, well-regulated approach to this particular trick. You know, she takes her time, she chases the last one, she gets it all sorted out. The other guys were really trying to help me out a lot here. <laughs> I got to do this. And anyway, <laughs> end, end up in insane rodent mode. Uh, Steph likes to turn her food as she eats it. She has it like, a, like an anaconda. And, uh, Mike has a future in ballet. <laughs> Just beautiful. Uh, down to the Russian bar and grill in the service module for something to eat. It's very nice down there. It's very homely. They have um, a table, so we can all sit around there and have dinner. Uh, trying the Russian uh, lamb and potatoes and onions. Tuesday nights is karaoke night down there. <laughs> and uh, 
That's right. See, Mikey's helped me out there, approving. And so, it's EVA 3. So how do you follow that up? I think I'll just sit here and be quiet. <laughs> Um, this is uh, EVA 3, so our, our first EVA was all about the boom. Second EVA was about uh, moving some, um, fixing some stuff on the outside of the space station and putting uh, some spare parts out there. And the third EVA was about doing this big, pretty important experiment, very important experiment. It was very successful. And what this experiment was about was to see if we could fix the heat shield on the leading edge of the orbiter, the reinforced carbon-carbon. So we had a bunch of tools to do that, a bunch of bags with a bunch of tools in it, and we had this really big box all the way in the back of the payload bay. And uh, here you can see what uh, one of the bags of tools look like. It's really a lot of stuff in there, and um, most of it is, is tied down or, or, or kept in place. Um, and then we, then we have uh, some samples, and on these samples, this is a this is uh, pieces of wing, essentially, and a putty knife and some putty. And this putty is called Noax, and it's pretty good at absorbing heat uh, and actually dissipating heat. Um, what was that, Mike? <laughs> uh, this is the EVA IR camera, uh, which we tested outside as well. And I think this is, uh, this is Piers here. So you can see some of the uh, joints on his spacesuit where uh, heat's, heat's coming out of. Um, this EVA lasted about seven hours, and uh, just last week we uh, tested these samples, and they worked great. And uh, this is the day that we uh, demated the multipurpose logistics module. Here's a view uh, moving away from the node. The logistics module, after having transferred 5,000 uh, pounds of cargo, and uh, there's a shot of the pedals closing uh, with the space station arm. We maneuver uh, the logistics module down into the payload bay and uh, berth it for return home with all of the return items. And uh, prior to flight, Lisa and I were dubbed the Robo Chicks, and Piers was kind enough to uh, do some space art for us, so we decided to show it off. Well, we had a great time, but then it's time to go. So here's some farewells, everyone uh, saying goodbye. And, you know, we think uh, they were really glad to see us when we got there. And then we think that they were really glad to see us go. <laughs> we had, we uh, kept everybody really busy. And uh, and uh, night after we left, he got about 12 hours of sleep. <laughs> so uh, it's time to shut the hatches. You can see some of that operation going on here. Got to get everything sealed up just right. And no time to rest. We're busy and it's time to do the undock. You can see inside, just like on the rendezvous, it's pretty crowded. Uh, Mark is at the controls now. You can see just behind his head, you can see uh, the actual uh, beginning of the undock taking place. And there it is from the outside. So we're watching out those overhead windows and Mark at the controls. See, again, on the inside, of course, there's lots of people taking pictures. We had all of us in there. You can't see me. I'm kind of buried down in the right uh, corner down below uh, working on some computer systems. You'll see the nose jets firing. There they go. And there's the station. We're moving away from it. And uh, throughout the rest of the day, we kept uh, busy doing a lot of things, starting to get ready to come home. And you could still look out the window and see the station getting farther and farther away. And we had lots of things to put away, all the, all the things we had gotten out uh, during the mission, all those EVA things and uh, a lot of the transfer items. A lot of things still need to be put away, so we kept busy doing that uh, for the next day until it's getting ready, time to come home. The day before, uh, you know, we have to land the vehicle, so we have this computer program called Pilot, and uh, it's just a video game, kids, so uh, that's all I'm doing is a video game. I'm highly paid just to play this game. And uh, so practice the game, and then the t time for deorbit, and uh, we get back in our orange pressure suits, and there's Piers trying to get me in. I think I've had my G-suit on backwards. He had to fix me. Um, then Piers getting in while we're up on the flight deck uh, getting ready to go. And we'll start our approach about 9,000 miles away from uh, where we're going to land. This is a shot from a mini cam on the flight deck. You see the little flash out the overhead windows in the upper left of your screen, and that's uh, plasma flashes as the atmosphere around us uh, is basically on fire because of the heat. There's uh, the view out the front. You can see the glow. If you uh, go about four to ten feet in front, 
temperatures all the way up to as hot as 10,000 degrees out there. Um, but that's what our your shields are designed to protect us from. And here we are coming into entry. And at about 50,000 feet, I'll take over manually to fly the vehicle. And this is looking out uh, the heads-up display out the front, what Mark and I are looking at. And you can see the runway out there. Um, we'll come in in a steep dive. And at about uh, 300 feet here, Mark's going to drop the gear. And the goal is to land this at about uh, oh, 200, 210 miles an hour, about 2,500 feet down the runway, and, uh, and hopefully land like an airliner and, uh, and not hurt anybody or hurt the wheels when I land. So coming for a landing, I did land at KSC for the fourth time, so that I was one out of two, um, and came in and land. And there's the wheels touching down right about there. And then the uh, next thing we do is, uh, is Mark deploys a drag chute, and that just slows us down a little bit and we'll lower the nose to the runway, uh, get on the brakes to slow us down, and, uh, and come to a stop after, uh, what was it, about 12 days, 18 hours, about 13-day mission. There we are rolling to a stop and uh, on another nice morning at uh, Kennedy Space Center. And uh, after we get stopped, we'll have about another hour of work to do inside the vehicle, uh, do some more switches and some more work, make sure the vehicle is safe, uh, for, for them, and then the ground crew approaches us, and eventually we get off the vehicle, and. Uh, there we are at the end, a, a very happy and very exhausted crew.